The internet is full of woodworking tips and while they seem like a good idea with fancy video editings, do they actually work in the real world? Today, we're gonna to be testing three viral woodworking tips to see if they live up to the hype or leave disastrous consequences on your project. First is the blue tape method, which is arguably the most popular woodworking tip on the internet. This is where you join two pieces of wood or anything really by applying ordinary painter's tape on both sides, laying down CA glue on one side and accelerator on the other. And when you press them together, the accelerator quickly hardens the glue within seconds. And now you have a temporary bond for applications like template routing, clamp-free work holding on a CNC, or even holding small and thin pieces on a workbench for sanding or hand planing where clamps would normally get in the way. Seems like a pretty good idea, right? You might have even used this technique with great success, just as I have. There are a few issues though. First, getting alignment between the two pieces of tape is difficult and it's easy for the glue to spill over onto your workpiece requiring additional cleanup. And here's the thing, this process is slow compared to the alternative, which is to just use double-sided tape. You peel and you stick. <laughs> you get perfect alignment, no glue spillover, and there is no fumbling between tape, glue, and accelerator. But how well do these two methods hold up? I have milled and drum sanded all of these sample pieces of cherry into a consistent surface. Since the most common force experienced by these temporary joints are shear forces, I'm going to test it on this jig by pulling them apart. Using identical size workpiece and area of glue surface, the blue tape method took 377 pounds to separate and in all instances, the failure was between the tape and the glue, not the glue joint. The double-sided tape test gave me a run for my money because it broke my jig a few times. This method took 668 pounds to separate. The blue tape method can also leave you with inconsistent height. At least that's what I thought. I figured that the CA glue can be poured heavier on one side compared to another and cure that way. This would especially be problematic in precision work like on that of a CNC where you want to remove all of the material without the cutter touching the tape or the spoil board. However, in my testing, I did not find this to be an issue. Here is an example of two precision blocks sandwiched by the blue tape method. By placing the whole thing on a precision granite surface and sliding a dial indicator from left to right, there's virtually no height variation. I tried this with thin, medium, and thick CA glue with very similar results. And of course, there was no height variation with double-sided tape as well. Not only was my hunch wrong, I also discovered that I need to go to the gym. Throughout this test, I have been using the X-Fasten double-sided tape for three reasons. They have a lot more adhesive on them with the fabric backing instead of paper. And because they're far cheaper with the pack of four coming in at 1650 compared to the paperback stuff that I used to use that costs almost the same for a single roll. I also find the X-Fasten to be more forgiving when it comes to the two mating surfaces not being perfectly flat because there's extra adhesive in there to buffer. According to the Amazon description, they collaborated with professional woodworkers on Instagram to ask their needed specs. Now, I find that offensive because I have a respectable following on Instagram and I'm happy to pretend to be a professional. The next tip is a little bit of a blast from the past, at least for me anyway, because I haven't seen this tip on the internet in a few years when just about everyone was talking about it. Which begs the question, do influencers dogpile on trends and feed you the same stuff without doing diligence? You're gonna find out soon enough, but for me, producing these woodworking testing videos takes a lot of effort. What you see on camera is nothing compared to the work that happens behind the scenes. And look, I know this stuff is not the sexiest thing on YouTube, but you're still here. And there's something beautiful about being able to share my ideas with you while justifying it as a business expense. So thank you. And if you like this type of unsexy stuff, consider subscribing and I will keep on delivering. Now, back to the actual tip. It is the salt trick. <laughs> the idea is when you're doing a bunch of glue ups, individual pieces can shift during clamping and the wood glue actually kind of acts like a lubricant and the pieces tend to slip around. So to reduce that, people recommend applying some table salt between the glue joints because it's gritty and it bites into the wood to prevent that slippage. Now, that seems to make a lot of sense to me, but I wonder if the salt will have a negative impact on joint strength. 
First, let's test this slippage theory. This is a jig that I created where the left section is stationary and the right platform is on ball bearings. I have two identical pieces of wood that have been properly milled with an equal amount of glue on both sides being spread by a roller. With just glue between the two pieces and a small weight placed on top that is similar to the initial clamping forces you would apply, it took an average of 354 grams of peak force to drag this block of wood. I decided to put this in grams because putting it in pounds would seem ridiculous. That is not a lot of force, you guys. It's very slippery. The next scenario is exactly the same, except this time we have a very small amount of salt sprinkled into the surface, trying to be as consistent as I humanly can. These salt-based samples took an average of 2,388 grams. That is a huge improvement. So given the drastic difference between the two methods and having physically felt that resistance, I can see why this method is recommended. Now, alignment is only half the picture. We glue things because we want strong joints, right? So does the addition of salt in wood glue weaken the joint? The best way to test this theory is to glue end grains because we can ensure that the point of failure will be the glue line and not the wood fibers because wood is superbly strong in this orientation. So. I made a bunch of sample pieces of cherry of the same dimension, same amount of glue, and sprinkled the same amount of salt and tried to clamp it with the same amount of clamping force using a sensor. All of that to say, I did my best effort to try to keep things as consistent as possible. Now, this is where I was shocked. Turns out, the amount of salt I was applying was way too much, and it was reacting with the wood glue. So, I decided to do what any good scientist would do. I applied a heck of a lot more salt to see how bad this issue can really be. And um, yeah, there seems to be a problem. The salt is uh, extracting, at least from what I can tell, a little bit of moisture from the glue and starting to solidify it. I suspect even with much less salt, this is what's happening at the microscopic level. That is not very promising, but I carried on with the tests, this time using much less salt, clamped them at the same pressure for 24 hours. After removing the clamp, you can see the unsalted sample had a nice tight fit on the left, while the salted sample on the right has a noticeable gap. But is the glue line still strong enough to hold things together? The wood glue only sample took 356.8 pounds of peak strength to break these joints. The salted sample took 281.4 pounds of force or 21% weaker than the glue alone joint. Interestingly, if you look at the broken salted joints, you can see not all of the salt grains melted and some are still visible with white specks around it like a bacterial colony. And if you lick it, <laughs> yep, it's still salty. Whoa. It is a neat trick that can help prevent slippage in your glue up, but even when you put the tacked glue, the visible gap, the weaker joint strengths aside, if you ask me, it just doesn't feel right doing it, and you can easily oversalt it without knowing it. So, if you need alignments, consider using calls, biscuits, dowels, dominoes, or whatever else you can think of that's gonna make it much easier and safer to get strong joints. Up next is a bonus tip. Consider it my holiday gift to you. Anytime you're doing glue ups, there's a good chance you'll get crusted glue on your clamps. I know some people recommend putting painter's tape down on the bar, but honestly, I find that to be a bit of a hassle. So instead, put wax on your bar a few times a year and when the glue dries, it'll come off much easier. If you already have crusty glues on your clamp, however, I've been told to soak the bar in PVC tube filled with vinegar and a little bit of water. So, I got one of my bars unnecessarily dirty with glue, dipped it into the vinegar solution, and after just a few minutes, the glue changed its color and it seemed like it could come off very easily. I left it overnight anyway, and to my surprise, all of the glue came off on its own. I did notice some of the shiny coatings on the bar came out as well, but it doesn't seem much worse than scraping the glue off and if some of the oxidized parts were to be cleaned off as well. If you have clamps that are in need of some TLC and you're having a hard time getting the glue off, especially the notoriously ribbed parts of the clamp, this is a very useful technique. Just make sure to wax it again after cleaning. Okay, the final woodworking tip is the sawdust and wood glue tip. 
We've got woodworking gurus telling us to save fine sawdust from each species of wood and hoard them for when you need matching wood filler that you can make on the spot by mixing sawdust with some wood glue. Unlike the scrap pile of wood that you're hoarding that you might actually use someday, I'm gonna call this one out. Let me explain. The tone and color of the same species of wood can vary a lot between boards. For example, here's a piece of walnut next to another piece of walnut. They look nothing like each other. Or here's a piece of cherry next to another and another. Ah, did I get ya? That last one was Purdue. And because the same species can have wildly different tones, when you're working on a project, try to use boards from the same batch at the lumber yard because it's likely coming from the same tree or trees grown under similar conditions. All of that to say, if you're saving sawdust from one project, it may not match your next project. So throw away those sawdust, you little hoarder. The second issue with the sawdust and wood glue tip is the very nature of applying wood glue to sawdust will change the tone of the final product relative to the normal wood. In this example, I'm going to shoot blanks using a 16 gauge nail gun to create the exact same voids on several species of wood. Now, I realize in the real world, you would probably use this technique to fill minor gaps on joints or cracks, but I want to use this as a way to highlight the point on color matching using this method. And here's a hot tip. If you find yourself with small dings or imperfections, instead of mixing sawdust and wood glue taken from the same board, which can be a little bit of a messy process, just dab some glue in the void and then run your sander on low or no vacuum. You can also rub a piece of sandpaper on top to create a slurry of neighboring sawdust to fill the void with a really good match. After you're done with it, it'll look like this. Almost like those divots were never there in the first place, right? Except there's no finish on it. So this is what a perfect matching sawdust will look like with a finish on the project. And if you're using stain on your projects for some reason, keep in mind that the repaired areas are not going to soak the stains the same way. So here is what a Sapili sample looks like with raw wood on the left, clear coat in the middle, and stain plus clear coat on the right. This is a mid-tone species of wood, and in the real world of repairing minor joinery imperfections, this would probably look pretty good. On darker woods like walnut, the color matches again, pretty decent. However, we start to run into issues with woods like cherry, white oak, and especially maple, because the addition of the wood glue darkens the tone that is particularly noticeable in lighter woods. Look. We all make mistakes, especially in woodworking. Some mistakes are easier to hide than others. This sawdust and wood glue trick, for example, works really well in small voids where even a bad color match isn't gonna be very hard to notice with the naked eye. I just ask that you lower your expectation on this type of repair for larger voids or lighter woods because this trick is not a cheat code for all of your whoopsies like most woodworking channels would make it out to be. Yes. You can get artsy by blending different tones of sawdust or using commercially available color matching wax or wood fillers, but that's a little out of scope for this video. Let me know if you enjoyed this type of tips testing video concept and if I should make more. Thank you for watching. I will see you on the next one.